Okay, welcome back. And now we're going to start uh, section B of chapter 5. Should you believe a statistical study? We're going to find out. Okay, so evaluating a statistical study. So most uh, statistical studies, uh, research is carried out with integrity and care. Nevertheless, statistical research is sufficiently complex that bias can arise in many different ways. We've seen some of the ways it can uh, come about. So now, there are eight guidelines that we're going to share with you that can help you answer the question, should I believe a statistical study? So the first guideline is get a big picture view of the study. Okay, try to answer the following questions. What is the goal of the study? What was the population under study? Was the population clearly and appropriately defined? Was the study observational or an experiment? If it was an experiment, was it... Uh, single blind or double blind? Uh, were the treatment and control groups properly randomized? Given the goal, was the type of study appropriate? <clears throat> okay, guideline number two, consider the source. Statistical studies are supposed to be subjective, but the people who carry them out and fund them may be biased. <clears throat> Actually, I think, I'm not sure if that's supposed to be objective. I would think that objective is more appropriate. <laughs> okay, guideline number three, look at, look for bias in the sample. Selection bias. So again, this occurs whenever researchers select their sample in a way that tends to make it unrepresentative of the population. We've talked about this before. You know, this is uh, dealing with the, the selection process, right? The, the sampling process, okay? Most of the sampling processes that we've talked about are will, will uh, <clears throat> um, result in a representative sample, but like convenient sampling, sometimes will not, or tend, will tend not to, okay? So again, we want to make sure we look at selection bias uh, participation bias, again, this primarily occurs with uh, surveys and polls. It arises whenever people choose whether to participate, right? So we've got voluntary response bias, right? Only people that feel um, strongly about a, a particular topic will bother to um, fill out the survey, participate. Then there's non-response bias, right? People may not feel like it or may not be able to respond. And so those people don't get counted. Okay, guideline number four, look for problems in defining or measuring the variable of interest. So a variable is an item or quantity that changes from subject to subject. Okay, definition of a variable, right? It changes. The variables of interest in a statistical study are the items or quantities that the study seeks to measure, right? So those are the ones that this, they're, 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 they're wanting to measure and get information about. So here's an example. A commonly quoted statistic is that law enforcement authorities succeed in stopping only about 10 to 20 percent of the legal drugs entering the United States. Should you believe this statistic? Okay, so there are essentially two variables here. Okay, there's the quantity of illegal drugs that are, that are intercepted. The quantity that is intercepted and then there's the quantity of illegal drugs that are not intercepted okay so it should be relatively easily easy to find the drugs the amount of drugs that are intercepted that's public record we can we can easily find that but what we don't know is the amount of illegal drugs that uh, total that come into the country or the amount of drugs that <clears throat> that are not intercepted, right? Okay, so we, we know one quantity, but we don't know the other. So in order to get the percentage, remember 10 to 20%, that's a, the, a proportion of the whole, right? We don't know what the whole is because we don't know what quantity of drugs entering the United States is not intercepted, okay? 
So um, in, a, in a New York Times analysis, a police officer was quoted as saying that this, uh, that his colleagues refer to this type of statistics as uh, PFA or pulled from, from the air. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay, now building guideline number five, beware of confounding variables. Okay, what is a confounding variable? Confounding means confusion right? Confusing. So to confound means to confuse, right? So what we're talking about are variables that are not intended to be part of the study, but were missed, right? Were not accounted for. And so they can make it difficult to interpret the results properly, where the results of the study coming from the variables we were interested in, or were they coming from these variables that we weren't expecting and uh, therefore confounding the results, okay? Such variables are known as confounding variables or lurking variables. Oops. <clears throat> Six, consider the setting and wording in the surveys, very important. Even when a survey is conducted with proper sampling and with clearly defined terms and questions, it is important to watch out for problems in the setting or wording that might produce inaccurate or dishonest responses. Okay. So here's an example. So the Republican National Committee commissioned a poll to find out whether Americans supported their proposed tax cuts. Asked, do you favor a tax cut? A large majority answered yes. Should we conclude that Americans support this proposal? Now, the question in and of itself is not a leading question. It's not a biased question. But the setting of the question is important because who are in the crowd? I mean, they're, um, they're all part of the Republican National Committee. And so since they're part of the Republican Party, then you... They, then, then they're predeposed. Yeah, <clears throat> they are inclined to answer a certain way based on their ideology, right? Just like Democrats do, and just like anybody else does. Okay. Um, now, they say that the question's biased because it doesn't give other options. Okay. Um, now. This is a yes or no question, but the way people answer yes or no may be based on all kinds of different reasons, right? Somebody, people may answer yes or no, and but for far different reasons, okay? Now, um, so again, so this could, you could see that this uh, um, suffers from the fallacy of the limited choice. In fact, other polls conducted at the same time showed a similarly large majority expressing great concern about federal deficits. Okay. So indeed, support for the tax cuts was far lower when the question was asked by independent organizations in the form, would you favor a tax cut even if it increased the federal deficit? So that would influence how people respond okay now now here's the thing there's an there's an even this question i think is not the best written because it implies that um uh, it implies that tax cuts inevitably lead to increased federal deficit okay um uh, not necessarily true right because there are other things that could uh affect that, right? Tax cuts, uh, decreased spending would help decrease the federal deficit, right? So there's other things that you can look at. So again, it's complicated. It's not easy to come up with questions and you've got to be very careful about the setting and, and the type of questions you ask. Guideline seven, check the results, check that results are fairly presented. Okay. So the study may be misrepresented in graphs, right? Or concluding statements. 
So they come up with a study, right? They do everything and they come up with graphs and the graphs may mislead or misrepresent uh, what the data says and it may mis mislead the audience uh, or they um, the concluding statements don't really match with what the study did. Researchers may misinterpret and result or jump to conclusions not supported by the results, right? So that's sort of like the concluding statements. <coughs> okay, so now example three, does the school board need a statistics lesson? So here we go. It says the school board in Boulder, Colorado created a hubbub when it announced that 28% of Boulder school children were reading below grade level and hence concluded that methods of teaching reading needed to be changed. The announcement was based on a reading on reading tests in on which 28% of the Boulder school children scored below the national average for their grade. Do you does does do these data support the board's conclusion? Okay, so here's what we have to look at. Let's look at the statistics here and make sure we understand what's going on. The fact that 28% of Boulder school children scored below the national average for their grade implies that 72% scored at or above the national average. Right? So look at the flip side. So therefore, the school board's ominous statement about students reading below grade level makes sense only if grade level means the national average score. Um, okay, so it only makes sense the as far as below grade level makes sense only if grade level means the national average score for a particular grade. Okay, so this interpretation of grade level is curious because it means that half the students in the nation are always below grade level, no matter how high the scores are. The conclusion that teaching methods needed to be changed was not justified by these data. Now, number eight, stand back and consider the conclusions. Ask yourself these following questions. Did the study achieve its goal? Right? Remember the goal. Do the conclusions make sense based on the result of the study? Can you rule out alternative explanations for the results? If the conclusions do make sense, do they have any practical significance? In other words, they may be significant statistically, but it may not amount to much of anything practical speaking, practically speaking. <laughs> So let's look at this example uh, for practical significance. In an experiment, an experiment is conducted in which the weight losses of people who try a new fast diet supplement are compared to the weight losses of a control group of people who try to lose weight in other ways. After eight weeks, the results show that the treatment group lost an average of a half a pound more than the control group. So this is eight weeks. Right? So on average, uh, the treatment group lost a half a pound more than the control group. Assuming that it has no dangerous side effects, does the study suggest that the fast diet supplement is a good treatment for people losing, wanting to lose weight? <clears throat> okay, so let's look at this. Now, compared to the average person's body weight, the difference of a half a pound hardly matters at all. Right? Because let's be let's face it, your your body weight fluctuates almost daily for most people. Uh, definitely on a weekly basis. So even if the study is flawless, the results don't seem to really have any practical significance. Meaning, okay, is it worth paying to have this this new diet pill, right? Um, if if it's only an average of a half a pound over an eight-week period, two months, right? I don't know. I don't think so. All right, there you go. There you have it.
Okay, as usual, please make sure that you use all the resources available to you. Okay, there's the uh, tools on my math lab, right? The videos, other videos other than this one. Um, there's Ask the Instructor. There's Examples. Um, there's the Tutoring Center. So please do what you need to do. And of course, if you have any questions, you you're, you can feel free to at, reach out to me and I'll help you in any way that I can via email. And uh, we'll go from there. Have a great day. Bye.